Hello, everyone. Welcome back to day two of Amaze Sex EdCon. My name is Dr. Rachel Gibson. My pronouns are she, her, and Aya. And I'm the senior program manager here at Amaze Education. And I'm your host for the conference tonight. Right now, I'd like to introduce to you my co-host, Lakara. Welcome, Lakara. Thank you, Rachel. Good hello and good day, everyone. I'm so excited that you all are here. My name is Lakara Simmons. I use she, her pronouns, and I am based in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm also the Amaze Program Manager. So, you know, there's been so much controversy lately about sex ed in the media, and it can be really hard and tricky to know how to respond. When you're faced with controversy or questions from a parent or an administrator, or even, you know, our family and friends. So what we really want to do today is offer you a space for learning and practice to know exactly what you're going to be, what are some great tools you can use to respond to some of that controversy. So our next guest is Jess McIntosh. Jess is a communication strategist, CNN commentator, and former co-host of the award-winning Sirius XM radio show, Signal Boost with Zerlina Zer and Jess. Jess is a consultant to progressive candidates and organizations looking to strengthen their social presence through media training, influencer engagement, story development, and national profile amplification. Her writing in politics about gender has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, CNN, Elle Magazine, Refinery29, Shondaland, The American Independent, Lenny Letter, and more. With over 15 years of campaign experience, Jess has worked at every level of American politics. Most recently, she served as senior communications advisor to presidential candidate Hillary Clinton, where she directed outreach to influencers and served as a national spokesperson. Please, everyone, welcome Jess McIntosh. I am so happy to be here. Thank you so much, Rachel. I really appreciate that. So I'm I'm Jess. I'm Jess McIntosh. Um, as Rachel said, I have a political campaign background. That's um, that's what I've done for the last 15, 17, very, very long time, many years. Um, what that means is that in that time, I've developed um, I've developed a few tools and tricks for dealing with disinformation. Now, I never thought that that particular skill set would come in handy with people who were just trying to do the good and important work of educating kids and keeping them healthy. Um, but here we are in the year of our Lord 2022, and it turns out that you all are dealing with um, things that very, very recently were just the purview of political campaigns. So um, I want to thank you for doing the work that you do and for helping kids. Um, I want to make sure that you are grounded in the knowledge that what you are doing is good and right, and the vast majority of people agree with that. Um, and I want to give you a couple of tricks for dealing with some of the nonsense that comes around in your communities. So let's get started. <laughs> we can go to the first slide. Some foundation setting. First of all, what are we talking about when we talk about sex ed? Sex ed is provided throughout the entire education of a student, K through 12. We are talking about honest information, age and developmentally appropriate information, medically accurate information, and culturally responsive information. We can go to the next slide. I want to stress this. I think this is one of the most important tools for dealing with disinformation, is recognizing that the disinformation campaign is there because they can't win on equal playing fields. You are the majority. 98% of voters support sex ed in high school. I don't think that clean water and safe roads get 98% support. 89% support it in middle school. We can go to the next slide because 92% of elementary school parents think that sex ed should be taught in schools. Now, 43% say K through five, but if you look at this list that we have on this slide, the kinds of things that are actually taught at the levels K through five in sex ed, they score wildly high. People want those kids to learn about friendships, healthy relationships, how to prevent bullying, sexual abuse prevention, accurate names for body parts, even different kinds of families, which is arguably the most controversial part of sex ed, receives 58% support. 
58% support is, is the kind of number that you see for gun safety. It's the kind of number that you see for lower inflation. It's the kind of number that usually represents this is the majority of people that want this. So I want you to take that knowledge and own it as you go into these conversations. We can go to the next slide. This is where we break it down a little bit more issue by issue. 65% of respondents, this poll was actually conducted by the Wall Street Journal, which is not a known bastion of liberal progressive ideology. 65% of respondents believe transgender people should be accepted by society. And that is just Americans. That is not Republicans, Democrats, independents, blue states, red states, none of it. 65% of America thinks that transgender people should be accepted by society. 71% support marriage equality, which is an all-time high. That number has never been as high as it is right now. 64% strongly believe that transgender people should be protected from discrimination. And more than 60% of Americans oppose banning LGBTQ lessons in school. We can go to the next slide. If you are feeling like warm, fuzzy hugs from everybody, you should be right now. Most of the people agree with you. So why is this so hard? <laughs> well, that's where we get to the disinformation campaign. We can go to the next slide. Some outside groups and politicians are heavily invested in confusing and scaring parents to score partisan points and gain political power. This phrase exists on this slide by itself because it is something that you will probably return to over and over again as you explain why people are seeing the kinds of information that they're seeing. The groups that don't want sex ed, the groups that know that this is the way that they're going to win elections, this is the way that they're going to stay in political power, um, they have to run these kinds of campaigns because they see the same numbers that I just read to all of you. They know that saying, we don't like sex ed, we don't want it in schools, is going to turn off all but 2% of the population. So of course, they don't do that. They run disinformation campaigns. We can move on to the next slide. Who are they? Well, the metaphor that I like to use here is for a, a stadium. Picture a stadium full of cheering people, um, but one section is booing. Now, if I walk into that stadium, it's pretty obvious what's happening, right? Stadium full of cheering people, one section's mad about it. Cool, we got it. Now, if I take megaphones and I hand them out to everybody in the booing section, and then I spread those people out throughout the stadium, now somebody walking into the stadium can't figure out what's going on. It sounds like chaos. It sounds like noise. And that is exactly the point. So on the left, you're going to see a lot of um, logos of groups that probably, unfortunately, look familiar to you. They have shown up in your communities before. Um, the reason why the anti-mask protests looked almost exactly like the critical race theory protests, looked exactly like the don't say gay bill protests, looked exactly like the protests against sex ed, is because they are all run by the same people. These are all the same organizations that just move from issue to issue because again, the point is scaring and confusing parents. So they stand up organizations like this because it lends a veneer of credibility to what is entirely a political campaign. So you might see the Medical Institute for Sexual Health and assume that that is, in fact, a Medical Institute for Sexual Health. You might assume that the Alliance for Defending Freedom is a legitimate legal uh, entity. They aren't. These are political entities. They are here to score partisan points and gain political power. Um, and they are up against absolutely all of us. We can go to the next slide. Let's table set just a little bit about what misinformation and disinformation are, because you have to deal with both of them, unfortunately. Misinformation is information a person believes is correct, but is not. So that's your aunt forwarding a Facebook post that you know isn't true, but you also know that she's very well-intentioned and she probably just believed it. Disinformation is the person who posted the thing your aunt's forwarded. Disinformation is information a person knows is false, but they are repeating it anyway, like a television host who shall not be named here repeatedly saying that your curriculum is grooming children. That is a disinformation campaign. We can go to the next slide. How does it show up in your community? Well, this 
lovely image uh, was brought to us from Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, and I know that when we talk about disinformation, we're, we're thinking about, you know, manila envelopes being passed at park benches and Cyrillic writing. And all. this is what it looks like when it shows up in your town. Uh, this was the campaign sign for a candidate for school board who had decided to make her entire candidacy um, about ending sex education. This was the clever way uh, she thought of to bring attention to that issue. For those of you who, who do not recognize what's happening here, congratulations, you are better people than, than I am. This is the Pornhub logo. And this is what Worcester, Massachusetts residents had to see in their neighbor's lawns, on their ways to school. I'm sure they had to ask, answer questions about it. It was designed to scare and confuse people and that's exactly what it did. I chose this image not just because it's amusing, but because it has a happy ending. That candidate lost badly because the community rallied together. They did not believe the disinformation. They spread accurate information. They didn't follow her down that rabbit hole. They did a lot of great things that we'll get into in the rest of this presentation, but, um, but it did ultimately work out. She did come in dead last. So we can go to the next slide. This is how disinformation is showing up right now. It's the don't say gay bill in Florida and the more than a dozen copycat bills that are currently being floated around the country. It is nationwide bans on classic books in schools, everything from American history to the Holocaust, race and gender. Um, in Texas, they actually banned a math textbook because it explained the concept of perseverance. I can't really tell what the problem with that is, but apparently they, they did not like it. Um, it is the legislation that is restricting which sports teams trans kids can play on. Um, and at this point, we have more proposed pieces of legislation restricting those kids than we have trans kids playing sports. We can move to the next slide. How do we fight back? Well, we fight back with facts. So let's frame the conversation right here. Remind families that the focus of sex ed is health and safety and that gatekeeping that information can be harmful from kids. I, I mean, when, when I was in sex ed, if I didn't get that information in school, I was gonna get it from a friend's older brother or maybe a magazine. Kids today are carrying supercomputers in their pockets and everybody knows that. There is no chance that a child is not going to find inaccurate information out there if they have a question that they want answered. So making sure that students are able to learn the right information that keeps them healthy and safe prevents them from learning information that might be harmful to their health. We can move on to the next slide. Sex education is not controversial. I know I just told you all of the stats, but we spend so much time talking about the controversy, it's, it's hard to believe. The reason why I'm stressing this so hard is because talking to sympathetic parents is even more important than trying to change the hearts and minds of the opposition. The truth is we don't actually need the 2% that don't think sex ed should be taught in high school. We, we can in fact win and keep kids healthy and implement the curriculum that we know works best. We can do all of that without that 2%. So what I want you to do is focus on everybody else. It is actually more important to talk to people who are already sympathetic because there are so many more of them. And a lot of times when we think about fighting disinformation, we think about you know, standing up and arguing against a QAnon or at a school board. And that's not really the conversations that we're prepping you for today. You're probably gonna talk to people who more or less agree with you already. We can move on to the next slide. This is the only slide that is a little bit communications 101 because it's, it's kind of counterintuitive. This is the only thing that shouldn't be obvious for you. Don't repeat the disinformation. Simply saying sex ed isn't controversial over and over and over again is not gonna help anything. Study after study has shown this is the way that the human brain cognitively works. Statements like, no pornographic material is used in sex ed curriculum, while accurate is actually counterproductive because after a few weeks, you might agree with that statement. You might know that sex ed isn't pornographic, but in your head, you're thinking there's something about sex ed and pornography and we don't want that. 
So what you're going to do instead when you're confronted with a piece of disinformation like sex ed is pornographic is you're going to answer with the accurate inf with the accurate information that omits the disinformation completely. So we can move to the next slide so you can see that in practice. I call this the power of no. If the question is, are you showing pornographic material to our students? The answer is no. Students in middle school learn basic foundational knowledge, such as information about their bodies, changes they're experiencing, friendships, key concepts like privacy and respect. See how I fully answered that question without debating whether or not sex ed was pornographic? I didn't even use the word. All I said was no. We can move to the next slide because there's a, a flip side to this one, this one rule that I have. Um, it's don't ignore the disinformation. We're not telling you to put your fingers in your ears and say, la, 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 everything's fine. We're not hearing anything bad. Call it out. You can say, there's a lot of bad information out there. People, disinformation campaigns work or they wouldn't run them. They're designed to scare and confuse parents, which means some parents are going to be scared and confused. Explaining to them why they are hearing inaccurate information is important. It establishes your own credibility. It, it leaves them less confused. So saying there's a lot of bad information out there. We're going back to the, the statement from that very first slide. The truth is outside groups and some politicians heavily invested in confusing and scaring parents to score political points. But, and this is a very important point, we think kids' safety is more important than politics. Almost every argument that you have, the opposition will try to make it about politics. And if you keep it focused on the safety and health of kids, you will be on far more productive ground. So we think kids' safety is more important than politics is a refrain that I want you to return to every time you feel like you're backed up against the wall and you're not sure how to respond. Kids' safety is more important than politics. We can move to the next slide. So these are the successful message frames that we have figured out uh, work the best for folks who may have seen something that confuses and scares them. One, sex ed is age appropriate. Two, Sex ed is inclusive. Three, sex ed is transparent. Every district does each of these three things differently, right? Every district tries to involve parents in some way, whether that's um, suggested conversations for the student to have at home or uh, take home sheets that are meant to be filled out by both or simply posting the entirety of your sex ed curriculum on the website. There are all kinds of ways where transparency shows up in sex ed. There are all kinds of ways in which age appropriateness shows up in sex ed. So figure out what's right for you and your district, but hitting those three really work. Uh, the reason why the fourth has an asterisk on it is because the fact that sex ed prevents child abuse is an excellent response, but only to a particular charge. So don't lead with it. We're going to lead with age appropriate, inclusive, and transparent, but we can go to the next slide. When you see that absolutely disgusting groomer charge out there, please feel free to respond that sex ed has been proven to prevent grooming and child abuse. It makes it easier for children to report if somebody does try to harm them. It in fact does the exact opposite of what that charge says. And you can ask medical institutions and pediatricians whether that's true. It's true. So we all know that. So we don't say lead with the fact that sex ed prevents child abuse. It's, it's, you have to do a little bit of mental math to figure out how that works. But if you're dealing with that grooming charge, please feel free to arm yourself with the facts and the validators that you need and let people know that sex ed in fact does the opposite. If you have to explain why that happens, how that happens, if you think about the basic foundational knowledge that we discussed kids learning in elementary school, if we start with healthy friendships, boundaries, consent, well in kindergarten consent looks like ask before you borrow someone's crayon. You can see how that knowledge gets layered on in an age appropriate and developmentally appropriate way until consent can be applied to sex when you're talking about teenagers. So obviously kids who have that foundational knowledge, one, they are less likely to be preyed on because predators choose kids who don't know those things. And two, they're more likely to report it, especially if they know the accurate names for their body parts and they know how to say, hey, something made me uncomfortable. An adult did something I didn't like, I didn't feel safe. So hopefully, very few of you are actually having to deal with the grooming charge. Um, but if you are, this is an excellent response to it. For everybody else, 
stick to the good ones, age appropriate, transparent, inclusive. And we can go to the next slide where we'll get into that inclusivity a little bit more. Feel free to stand up for these beliefs. Inclusivity just means respect for everybody. So there are two key points that I wanna make here. One, every single one of our schools includes LGBTQ kids, every single one. Every public school, every private school, every Catholic school, every single school includes LGBTQ kids. They deserve an education that speaks to them. I would like to think that that's enough of a point that we don't need anything else. That should be enough for people, but just in case we do, multiple studies have shown that learning in an environment that treats all kids, including gay and trans kids, with respect and dignity creates a safer environment for all kids, regardless of how they identify. So your straight kid is less likely to be bullied, harassed, um, experience physical threat or harm in a school that treats LGBTQ students with respect and dignity. So in fact, it is both good for the kids who identify that way and positive for the kids that don't. So we can move to the next slide. Finding common ground is one of the most important tactics when you are dealing with a conversation that could become contentious. Um, what you want to do is meet the person where they are. Probably they are in that cohort of people I described in the beginning who largely agree with you, who understand that sex ed is important, but they have seen something and it scared them. I mean, some of the, you've seen some of this stuff. Some of the stuff is scary. If you believed it, it would, it would frighten you. So assume that that's what people are coming to you with. Assume that that's the energy and meet that concern. That energy probably comes from the fact that they really want their kids to make healthy decisions. They really want their kids to be safe at school. They're very concerned about, about their, you know, their, their, their kids making the right decisions at school and feeling healthy and safe. And that's good news because you share those concerns. So that gives you immediate common ground to start working from. If they care about their kids' safety, you care about their kids' safety. So let's start there. And we can move on to the next slide. So we're meeting their concerns where they are. And then this is, this is the key point. You say, I share those concerns. I believe that kids should be safe and healthy in school too. That's why I support sex ed. Now, the thing that you want to do, like the thing that the human brain wants to do is say, yeah, I agree with you, but, but we all know what happens when you say, but it negates everything that comes before and after it. All you're communicating is that you disagree. So we're going to change the but to that's why. I hear that you're concerned for your kid's safety in school, what they're learning. I am also very concerned that your kid learn age appropriate material in school. I am also very concerned for their safety. That's why I support sex ed. We can go to the next slide. A few of the tips and tricks for combating a serious disinformation campaign, like the one that the folks in Worcester, Massachusetts had to deal with, it takes a village. And this is honestly work that you can do right now before your district is in whoever's sites, um, before you're dealing with a controversy, pull these groups together. You want validators who are going to be able to speak about why sex ed matters from each of these groups, parents, educators, students, public health officials are incredibly important. Um, we live in a very polarized time in America right now. It is very difficult to find any group of people that enjoys widespread trust. Um, pediatricians, pediatricians still enjoy widespread trust. So if you can find pediatricians to say sex ed is good and good for your kids, that is the gold standard. But of course, that's not it. There are faith leaders who understand this. Of course, LGBTQ orgs are going to have your back when it comes to inclusivity. Um, you can also look right here to Advocates for Youth and Amaze, your Planned Parenthood, local affiliates, reach out to people and, and create your little village that's gonna be there to help you combat sex ed uh, disinformation when it, when it does show up in your schools. We can go to the next slide because you're going to deploy these people as external validators. You're gonna have them speak up at school boards. You'll have them speak up at any community event where the disinformation might be present. You'll have them write op-eds um, in this case, both of these come from, uh, from Worcester, Mass, and we had a, a group of, of sex worker survivors who wanted to write on behalf of sex ed. 
it was a little bit of like an unusual alliance, but it was an absolutely great piece of validation to have in front of the community just as we were fighting that fight. And then of course the board of health backing your school sex ed curriculum. That's again, we're going back to that gold standard. You want to be able to say, look, the medical community understands that this makes kids safer and healthier. It's really hard to come back from something that good, especially if we remember that we think our kids' safety is more important than politics. And that's why we support sex ed. We can go to the next slide where I'm pretty sure I'm going to ask you if you have any questions. Wow, that was awesome, Jess. Thanks. So we have I'm tons of questions chat going so chat. fast, yeah. so hard. <laughs> Yeah, the chat is on fire. I love it. Folks are like really excited. Um, so much great information. So we do have some questions in the chat. Um, the first one is, as a parent, um, this person has been asked to give a two minute speech to the school board about why they support comprehensive sex ed. Can you give them a few tips about what they should say in that situation? Yes, yes, I can. I love this question. Um, talking in front of school boards is just great. And the first tip is so obvious. Say you're from the school district. Because that's going to put you at odds with the vast majority of the opposition speaking at that school. Remember that list of, of groups that I told you about? They're all the same people, the anti-maskers, the anti-CRTers, the anti-sex editors, they're all the same. Well, they have to bust them in. Like, you actually can't create an organic movement of parents who hate sex ed when 98% of parents want sex ed in high school. So if you've got people standing up and shouting about sex ed in your school board, they're probably not from there. So when you stand up, the first thing you're gonna say is, hi, I'm a parent at this district, or hi, I went to school here, or hi, I'm a taxpayer, I own the business on Main Street, or I have nieces who, whatever your relationship is to that district, because you have one, um, state that right up front. You're gonna have about three minutes to talk, usually two to three minutes. I would practice that at home because it goes by so fast. Like two minutes is really, you'll, you'll be through that before you even realize it. So practice it at home. You maybe want to say why sex ed matters to you specifically. Do you have a story that you can tell from your own sex ed experience, from the sex ed experience that your child got? Um, and then use one of the talking points that we talked about, transparent, age appropriate, inclusive. Uh, thank the board for their time and their work. And, and you can sit right back down knowing that you've done an excellent job. That's awesome. Thank you, Jess. Um, I spoke at the uh, Miami-Dade School Board meeting earlier this year, and I, I was able yeah. to use some of those tips, and it was very helpful. And I will say practicing in those three minutes is definitely important, because before you know it, that time is up. You can find um, a buddy. Like, somebody's going to be yeah. very happy to sit in front of you while you practice your two or three minute speech and, and also utilize the bathroom mirror. There is nothing stranger than talking to yourself in the mirror about something important, but um, it really does help. <laughs> Right, I totally agree. Um, awesome, so we have a, a couple more questions. Um, what tips do you have for sharing the correct information on social media? This is a really good question because it actually has a couple of layers. Um, one of the things that happens with a disinformation campaign, especially one as outlandish as the kind that they're usually running against sex ed, is that you kind of want to shout, they're lying from the mountaintops. But imagine seeing a Facebook page where somebody is saying something wrong about sex ed. They're, they're, I, I don't even want to repeat disinformation here, but they have, they have put up something that is absolutely untrue and deeply disturbing about sex ed in your school. You might have the impulse to call a reporter and be like, look, people are lying about sex ed on Facebook. All that's going to do is make sure that the lie spreads to a wider audience than that Facebook page ever would have said. So as upsetting as it is to leave false charges unanswered, you really want to answer the disinformation where it's showing up and only where it's showing up. And you don't want to repeat the disinformation. So if somebody on this hypothetical Facebook page is saying sex ed is pornographic, I'm not saying that you should at 10 p.m. get on your laptop and start arguing with them about whether or not it's pornographic. Consider creating a graphic 
that talks about the age appropriate nature of your sex ed curriculum linking to the curriculum itself, perhaps. So if that graphic is viewed outside of the context of that Facebook page, the audience is just thinking that they're getting good information about sex ed as it's taught in their schools. If that graphic is viewed on the Facebook page, it's a really clear refutation to the nonsense that's being put there. So, so respond where you see it and respond uh, without, without repeating the disinformation. Just include the accurate information that contradicts the lie. Uh, such good tips. Social media is so tricky. Yes. Awesome. Um, so we have another question. Um, you know, what advice can folks that work for the state government do when they live and work in a state where they're not supposed to talk about it? Can we advice for those Ooh, folks? That is That's a, a really, one I know. A tough and important question, but I would say have conversations with your friends and family. Like not every conversation needs to be done on letterhead in a public way. Um, and a lot of times, I think because sex ed is so non-controversial, people have no idea that it's under attack. A lot of times I, I wind up talking to districts that are really taking heat, but if you don't watch Fox News, you don't even realize that anyone's talking about the district. So one of the best things that we can do to combat disinformation is to spread the fact that it's happening, not what they're saying, but the fact that it's happening and, and the accurate information that people need to know. So I would say some casual conversations with girlfriends and family members and uh, you know your casual acquaintances, not in your capacity as a state government official is probably also deeply, deeply helpful. Thank you so much. Um, folks are wondering, a few folks in, in the chat are wondering about, um, is there an online website or what should folks do about reporting disinformation? Isn't do you know anything like about where they can go? I mean, you can always report on almost every social media platform. There is a, a report for harassment, report for inaccuracy, um, depending on which social media platform we are then at the mercy of Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk and their people to uh, take that information and do right by it. So um, I prefer uh, trying to combat the disinformation than trying to spend time getting it to come down because one is a much, much higher lift than the other. Uh, yeah, that makes sense for sure. Of course, if you if you uh, see threats, report and report to law enforcement. It's not about Zuckerberg and Musk at that point. Call the cops. Yeah, for sure. And definitely keep yourself safe. To, safe. Um, all right. So there is another question that we have. Um, folks are curious really about like what happens when the, this argument is turned around on people spreading disinformation. And like, why are they you know, preventing students from getting abuse prevention education. What do you think folks are trying to hide? What's kind of the underlying motive for this? Jeez, I mean, if I had the real, I mean, I, I think I think the answer is fairly simple. It's 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 the political power of it all. Um, what happens when you successfully combat disinformation with facts is that they move on to another issue. Um, that's why we're seeing sex ed on the chopping block right now. It's because they moved on. Book bans were very unpopular, it turns out, and they needed something else. Uh, so what happens when you win is that they will target something else. The point is scaring and confusing parents. The point is not actually ending sex ed. And I think that's, that's almost the saddest part of it. It's not really that mm. they don't want kids to have child abuse preventing curriculum in their school. It's that they want parents to be scared and confused because if they have to run on their honest agenda, nobody actually wants that. And so they will not win. It is very wow. depressing to think about it that way. Yeah. But um, that is what it is. Yeah. Oh, gosh. But there is hope. And I think I thank you so much for this presentation today. I mean, so many good tools for us to think about. I wish that when I was a teacher in the classroom, I would have had this presentation. That was one of the hardest things for me is, uh, you know, a parent coming up to me and saying this. And I was like, ah, what do I say in return? Find common so ground that, that parents just yeah, concerned. You share their concerns. Exactly. That's why sex ed. <laughs> yes, exactly. Thank you so much. I know that everyone out there is so appreciative. Everyone loves this. Um, 
folks, uh, let's give a big shout out to Jess McIntosh. Thank you so much for being here. I know a lot of folks are asking about slides. We will be sharing all the slides and the recording. So all of this information will be made available to you. Awesome. Thank you Thanks so, so much, much for Jess. doing what you Let's do. Uh, our pleasure, for sure. Keep fighting the good fight.